from the University of Minnesota, and my, my advisor is Professor Zeli Zhang. Uh, hi, my name is Arvind Narayanan. Uh, I'm, I'm also studying computer science in the uh, University of Minnesota Twin Cities. I'm uh, doing a PhD, um, and my advisor is also Professor Zeli Zhang. Hi, my name is Mirza Muhammad Shahri Al Masood. Uh, I'm doing my PhD in telecommunication and computer networking. My advisor is Dr. Deepak. <coughs> Okay, very good. I'm from uh, University of Missouri campus. Yeah, very good. And so without further ado, so you can go ahead and start. Okay. So our project is Dashing with Genie. So let's get started. Here is our agenda for today. First, we're going to introduce the problem statement, the objectives, and then we are describing the approach which we used. And then we are going to into more details with the experiment design and the genie resources and tools which we used for our project. Then we are going to uh, present a live demo and uh, we will uh, introduce our observations about the results which we got and some feedback at the end. So for the problem statement, we are designing an environment, uh, a, a test bed in order to modify the DASH protocol so that it has the capability of directing uh, user into different locations instead of just one location using the Gini test bed. So Dash actu actually is a dynamic adaptive streaming protocol, which means um, all of us are just watching vi videos on uh, YouTube, Netflix, or Hulu. So how this works? First, you start by fetching a manifest file which describes the different chunks so if we have one video, it will be divided into different chunks of equal segments. And actually we have these segments of different quality bit rates. Say we have 100 kbit, um, 200 kbit, up to megs. So how we choose actually which bit rate we would like to display for our video. This is based on the current uh, bandwidth and the current internet uh, and network conditions. So adaptive means you just start by a bit rate, and if the conditions allows you to go to, the, to a higher bit rate, then you upgrade your bit rate. If the conditions is not uh, good enough, it means in, uh, instead of we need the, instead of just waiting for the video to be buffered, so we will just minimize the quality rate so that you have a smooth viewing. So it's it's not of a quality of a higher quality. Um, so this is the dash protocol. Our objectives for this project that we would like to add some intelligence to the client side so that it's not only switching between bit rates but also switching between different um, edge servers. So the edge servers actually typically are where the different chunks and different bit rates are stored and the client connected to one of these edge servers or more than one in order to fetch these chunks. So for the dash protocol actually it sticks with one edge server which it got from the content provider through its manifest file. But in our modified dash protocol, we are going to contact more than one edge server in order to check which one is better for the current network conditions so that we can fetch our chunks from this edge server. We are also using Genie testbed in order to demonstrate our understanding of the resources and the tools available and the concepts, concepts introduced through this uh, summer camp. So this is how we start. As we were instructed, just start simple and small. So this is our topology in one aggregate manager. We have different subnets and we just used um, a router in order to uh, have different subnets talk to each other. So let's describe our approach. First, a user wants to watch a certain video. So it sends a request back uh, it sends a request to the content provider. The content provider prepares an MPD file for this client and then sends this back to the user. From this, actually, the user will know that the content requested is hosted in edge server A and edge server B. So it's going to request the first chunk of this video from edge server A and do some measurements. So say we are going to check the latency um, what's the time which we needed in order to download this first chunk. And then we are going to request the second chunk from the second edge server and measure the time as well. 
So by comparing these two times, we will find that edge server wins. So it has the lowest time, then it's the best choice for our next chunks. So we are going to request the next 10 chunks from this video. So 10 actually is a parameter which we can configure how often you would like to do these measurements. Uh, after these 10 chunks, we are going to restart this process and see if this server went down or it's busy and this one becomes more available, then we are going to switch to server B and so on. Uh, so is it clear? Uh, do you have any questions? Okay. Um, so from the picture which you just showed, we switch it to this one. In this, we have three aggregate managers, one at Wisconsin, the second at Missouri, and the third at Stanford. And we have these stitched links between these three AMs. At Stanford, we have our content provider, we have edge server A, and we have a user which is in the same subnet. At Missouri, we just have a user. And at Wisconsin, we have the second edge server and also another user. Our uh, experiment uses Gini resources. As, we, as I just mentioned, we have three aggregate resources from Stanford, Missouri, and Wisconsin. We basically just used uh, VMs for all our resources. So for Stanford, we used four VMs for the content provider, edge server, user, and router. And same for Missouri and Wisconsin. And we have three stitched links between these three, M, uh, three AMs uh, in order to form a mesh for the three routers to be able to communicate with each other. Um, the tools we used, we used Genie Portal. We used Stitcher from the Omni tool for the stitching and initializing the slides. We used Flux for editing the R spec. And we used GitHub for version control during um, progressing through our experiments. A little bit about the implementation. So we have the communication between the client and the content provider through socket programming. And we have the communication between the client and the edge server through a web server. We used Apache for this one. And so we, here are some workarounds or some assumptions just before, because we don't have much time. So we assume that edge servers will have all the video chunks preloaded. So we don't do this online, but we just do it manually offline. And we use WGET in order to substitute for video streaming, so we are just downloading the chunks, but we were not playing them. Okay, so here is the time for our demo. Um, do you have any questions so far? Okay. So um, I have all the terminals open for... a bit difficult for me I'll just use the mouse. Okay, so here are all the uh, terminals. So this green one is the content provider. Um, these are the three users that we have. Um, so I'll just start the server on the content provider. So I'll just run the server over here. So the server is running on port 5000. As you see, I'll just increase the font size. If yep. um, So this is user one. Uh, user one is sitting at Stanford. Um, so I'll just initiate a video request from user one. So it's just asking which video should I, I want to download or view. So I select one. So now it contacted the server and it's downloading all the chunks from, uh, from the edge, edge server. So we don't know which edge server it's actually contacting. It is uh, on the fly. It does all those 
um, it does the process which Iman described earlier as in check which uh, location is nearby and uh, which downloads quickly and choose that for the next 10 chunks and then restart this process. So as we see all the, all the videos are downloaded and um, if I just do an ls all the chunks as you see these one two three these are all the chunks um, so similarly we can run that we can run the same script across all these servers so what we have done is for um, we've already done all these um, uh, downloading from various users and generated some graphs which will be helpful to kind of explain what's happening behind the scenes so here, as we see, this represents uh, for a Wisconsin use, user. So as, as you know, as Iman described, I don't know whether we should probably just draw the. Uh, I guess you can see So we have this Wisconsin user over here. Uh, and here we also have the Edge server. We have the Stanford server over here. and. We also have the Edge server over here. And then we have this Missouri user. So what has happened is, this is for the Wisconsin user. And as you see, both servers are up. That means both the Edge servers, the Edge server as, at Wisconsin as well as at the Stanford are up. So as you see, most of the chunks are getting downloaded at Wisconsin. The dots that you see over here are to, are to check which one is uh, giving you more, more uh, I mean, latency. I mean, sorry, less latency. And then we go to Wisconsin. I mean, this, this graph shows you, shows you if we actually uh, bring down Wisconsin server, what happens. So it actually chooses Stanford instead because it, it didn't get a reply from Wisconsin. And here, as you see, uh, initially Wisconsin was down and we made it up, so it actually jumped to Wisconsin. So that's how this graph works. How do you generate the graph? These graphs? So we actually are uh, generating a, a log. So when we actually ran that script, we are uh, calculating the I mean, time it took to download every chunk. So when we get that time, uh, I mean, the download time, we compare it with both the edge servers. So this is a second observation for Missouri user. So as you see, Missouri user is not in either of the uh, aggregate manager where the edge servers are there. So it's kind of somewhere in the middle. So it needs to figure out which edge server it needs to contact. So initially what we did was Wisconsin server was down. So it always, I mean, it chose Stanford. But then when both the servers were up, it kind of switched, in, I mean, depending upon the network load, it uh, switched between Wisconsin and Stanford. <coughs> so as you see over here, between 70 and 80 chunks, I mean the chunk, when the chunk uh, 70 to 80 were getting downloaded, probably the latency kind of increased, due to which it had to kind of uh, switch to Stanford. And then what happened was Stanford, Stanford was kind of more compared to Wisconsin later on because probably the network conditions for Wisconsin came back to normal or something. So it again switched back to Wisconsin. So that's how it's kind of showing you um, how the protocol works. Here um, we have another observation wherein we are running all the three users simultaneously. And as you see, the nodes Wisconsin and Stanford are have the edge servers in the same subnet. So they kind of have a very low latency. The spikes that you see is because of our algorithm where it tries to check which, which chunk location, which edge server is closer. And for Missouri, as you see, the latency is kind of little higher than compared to the ones which are locally in the same subnet. What's the y-axis? The y-axis, it's the latency in, in seconds. In yeah, sorry, milliseconds. Oh, sorry, sorry, seconds, yeah, sorry. Seconds. Yeah. yeah, I have to put that. Um, okay, so these, I mean, all these graphs were kind of intuitive and you could kind of um, 
uh, predict the kind of uh, what what would happen if a user is in that subnet, which location it would choose. But then we kind of went into some different aspect to kind of see how things can differ. So here what we did is, so like Iman previously told, after every 10 chunks, we are kind of restarting the algorithm as to check which location is um, uh, faster. So here what we did was, we changed that number 10 to different numbers. So with number two, that means every two chunks, you're kind of checking whether you, uh, I mean, you're kind of checking the location, best location. So here, it is taking like 41 seconds to download the whole file when the threshold is set to two. If you set it to five, it keeps on decreasing. So as you kind of have a very high uh, number of threshold, it, it is kind of very low. And this, this kind of pattern is only seen for a user who is local to that same subnet. I mean, it, it, that's, that's kind of, this, this is again kind of, uh, you can predict this behavior, but then the interesting part is over here. When, the, when like a user like Missouri, who is not in, in either of the subnets of uh, the edge server, uh, you, you cannot kind of predict the behavior, as in when you change these thresholds, you don't know how many chunks, after how many chunks you should restart the process. So this is where the intelligence comes, and what, what we think is probably YouTube, and all these clients have some intelligence to see how this works. So I mean, uh, this is where the Dash protocol kind of expands to the community. So some of the feed, I mean, some feedback that we kind of probably you can take. Okay. So actually, when we are uh, going to uh, going through the process, we uh, have observed several kind of things. Like uh, we <laughs> had to face a lot of trouble uh, while we were trying to do the stitching, and uh, it took a long time, and maybe we had to pass like almost uh, the whole day <laughs> for this kind of thing and our code was ready but it took a long time that's why okay uh, so and uh, the loading our specs to flag tends to lose the IP configuration settings that is another feedback from us and the aggregate managers should be named and listed uh, consistently throughout the genie portal and could be sorted by name so that it can be easier for us to find it out okay and then Powerful RSpec editor probably even have version control support. So uh, now, uh, kind of some acknowledgement from us. It's like we would like to thank all the GREAC 2014 organizer, uh, organizers <coughs> and instructors, uh, and they were really helpful. And I think uh, we have learned a lot of things within this very short period of time. Uh, we also th thank Jeannie for providing resources and the hands-on training to use them. A, a special note of thanks to Sarah <laughs> for mentoring us for the project. Yeah, I mean, without her, this wouldn't have been. I mean, we couldn't have bought yeah. the network. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> so, thanks to all. Okay. Uh, my name is Hao Tian. Um, I'm a PhD student in Kansas State University. Hello everyone, my name is Xin Li from Kansas State University. Hello, my name is Yu Hao Sun. Uh, I'm now I'm the Living Scholar in the Iowa State University. I came from the China Daniel Research uh, uh, Daniel uh, <coughs> Telecom Research. Okay, so um, this is our topic here is SDN security, attacker identification, and flow rerouting. Um, I will do the presentation today. So um, let me introduce our problem. There are some security issues in SDN. Um, um, the security issue often happens in um, two different places. The first one is from controller to switch, which is the security channel. Um, it happens when uh, the s controller is trying to set up some routing table and the, um, this package of rows uh, may be modified. And the uh, second is uh, from host to server. It's, uh, so the main issue is how to identify who is the attacker and how to, how to um, prevent this from happening. 
So this is our experiment design. Um, in a normal topology of network, um, there should be a client and a server connected to an open, open flow enabled switch. So there should be a controller. This is the, the basic topology. Um, and you know there may be some other clients like client two, client three also connected to this switch. So we want to um, um, sniffer the the whole network because we want to see what's happening in the network. Is there any uh, anything that is abnormal? So um, we add a sniffer, and the sniffer actually is a good guy, and it will um, uh, monitor all the traffic in this network. What the sniffer does is um, we set up a flow entry in the in the switch, and any packets that from a client sent to the server will be duplicated to the sniffer. This is our idea. And um, let's imagine there's an attacker. Uh, it's connected to the switch and it wants to attack the server. And what we want to do is to protect the server. So um, the controller will um, stop this from happening. So it can just simply stop this connection and um, and the attacker will never um, communicate with the server. But actually it's not what we want to do. What we want to do is let the attacker contact with the sniffer. The reason we do this is by doing this we can collect some information uh, and um, this information can be used for future maybe for protection, maybe for um, attacking back, perhaps. So, um, so we want to reroute the traffic from attacker to server to the sniffer, and we do not want the attacker knows we have rerouted. So the main idea is if the, attack, if the switch re received a, uh, a packet from attacker to server, it will change the destination to the sniffer. And if the switch receives a package from sniffer to the attacker, it will change the um, source IP address to the server. So that the attacker seem, um, thinks it is talks to the server. Yeah, it's how sniffer works. Hello, I'm server. So, um, in our in the in the our first um, first try, um, we did it in a really simple way. Uh, we have a authorized IP addresses list. Um, all the IP addresses in this list are um, trusted, and all the IP addresses not in this list are we are considered to be attackers. So this is our topology. Um, uh, the left one is just as I, as I just said, I created a client, an attacker, a server, and a sniffer. The client is trying to um, contact with server, um, which will be duplicated to the sniffer, and the attacker wants to connect to the server, but um, the flow was redirected to the sniffer, but the attacker don't, doesn't know that. And um, this is the uh, in a slice and the controller is in another slice. The switch and the controller are connected using remote connection. So this is our design. Um, note that all the all this should be in the same subnet. Um, we assign the IP addresses and the um, port. And note that we must uh, use the no Mac learning on all these on all these hosts. And controller is remotely connected and switch uh, have all the IP uh, parts brought down because we use the bridge. Why we should use no Mac learning? Um, let's see this topology. There's a client one, client two, and a sniffer. But actually, because um, all these are virtual machines running on some, some computers, 
So the sniffer is actually behind a software switch. When the client is trying to send something to the uh, client one, trying to send something to client two, as I said, it will be duplicated to the switch. And because it's a software switch, it will have, if it, uh, the Mac learning has not been disabled, mm -hmm. it will know that um, I receive a, a message from one in this direction. So if I want to send something back to one, I should send back to this direction. This is what it knows. And after that, the client two sends something to one. Also, it can be duplicated. So um, at this point, the switch is uh, confused that it wants to transfer um, a packet that is to one to the direction that it receives it. Um, that is totally incorrect. So it will be discarded. And if it is discarded, the sniffer will never receive this. So that's the point that why we disable the Mac learning. We want the sniffer to receive anything. Let's see the realization. Um, as I said, I, uh, we prepared a list of trust IPs. And when an uh, IP, uh, when packet comes, it uh, see if the, all the source and destination IPs are in the list. If any of them is not in the list, we think it's a uh, packet from or to uh, attacker. So we need to do some modification. We have said the modification just now. And let's see um, another topology. If the, um, the users, the host, the nodes connected to the switch is really, really huge, like um, this is only seven and maybe 100 and 1,000, we cannot know which one is the attacker. And it is not feasible to add all these IP addresses to, to a list. Um, like this, we, we will never know, like C4 or C6, they are attackers. So um, we need something, um, some, me uh, some method to add the, add the list um, dynamically. So um, the idea we come up is ident identify large flow. If we see a flow is uh, relatively large, um, we will send it is we will think it is the attacker and reroute all the traffic it sends. So how do we um, do this? We know there's a flow table. Uh, it's actually a mm, it's something like a routing table, but it's more flexible um, in the in OpenFlow in the switch. Um, it is consists of header, counters, and action. The header can be anything like IP, MAC, VLAN ID, and the action can be anything. And we note that there is a counter here. The counter is used to um, uh, used for statistics and um, calculate um, how many bytes, how many packets we have received according to this flow entry. Like, uh, for example, um, this means the source IP address is 1.1.1.1, and uh, we have received um, this much bytes from this source. So um, um, what we need to do is just get the counter periodically and calculate the flow rate. For example, if we um, get the counter value every three seconds, and we know the current um, bytes is 10,000, and um, three se seconds ago is 1,000. So the difference is 9,000, and um, we can know it is 3,000 bytes per second. And if, the, if the, the value is larger than a threshold we have set, we will think it is an attacker and uh, put it in a blacklist. All the users in the blacklist will be disabled for a period period of time, like 30, 30 seconds. Uh, and in this time, it can only contact to, connect to the, to the sniffer. Um, we will do the demo after, um, after this presentation. Um, so 
our future work for this unfinished work, um, just now I mentioned two ways to um, identify a, a attacker. One is make a list, and the other is see the see the size, see the flow size. Um, the flow size method is halfway done, so uh, our future work is to finish this work. And um, in these two methods, we only uh, modify the TCP flows to sniffer, and next step may we want to change TCP only to all traffic. And uh, what we want to do next is um, some network data statistics. For example, um, in this flow size identification, uh, we want to know what is the threshold. It is um, not a number that we come up um, easily, so we need to do some statistics and see uh, um, above what threshold um, it should be some um, abnormal flow and uh, should be considered to an uh, attacker. And the topology, um, we want to experiment on large scale. So um, we want to do these two steps um, on Gini and see if um, Gini can support our uh, future experiment. Um, and uh, last but not least, we want to identify attacker in some more accurate ways. Uh, we just mentioned two methods, and maybe um, we can see into the package and see if there are some spiteful content, and maybe uh, we will have a table, uh, ha have a list, and see if uh, a source is um, sending repeated meaningless requests, we will think it is an uh, attacker. And there are some small bugs um, uh, which should be solved uh, in the future. The first one is time sh shifting. Um, oh. Let's see, um, this is the, the timer I uh, created in the Python. Because uh, in my um, model, I should get the um, statistics every three seconds. So we can see the seconds 22, 25, 28, 31. Uh, blah blah blah, and um, there's the milliseconds here. When it's uh, zero one, the milliseconds is two nine four, and after a minute is three one three. We can see the milliseconds is always increasing, and um, in one minute time it has increased uh, twenty millise milliseconds. So um, it is not a uh, accept acceptable um, scale. Uh, we want to um, rewrite the, the thread in Python so that it can solve this problem. <coughs> and another problem is link bandwidth shaping. Um, in our model, we want the attacker sent at a, a really um, large bandwidth, like 100 meg, and the, the client, normal client, just send at um, 1 megabit or 10, mega, 10 megabit. So what we want to do is to um, scale the, the bandwidth. We wanted, we tried to do that on Gini, on Flag, uh, because there's a link and we can click on that and uh, set what uh, I want this bandwidth to be. Um, but it doesn't work and we don't know why. Um, so maybe we will try it later. And finally we did that with P TC. It's, uh, is a Linux command. And um, the finally is the resource expiration, expiration time. Um, we finished a lot of work um, on Wednesday, but because the, the Utah DDC has a really, really short um, expiration time, uh, all the resources on that um, server expired, and we have to do that again. It's some um, uh, feedback we provide to Jamie. And uh, the resources we use is Utah DDC Virtual Machine, thank you Utah, and Pox OpenFlow Controller, um, which is really, really nice to use. And uh, finally, Jamie Desktop Flag, it is 
are very, very useful um, 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 tools to use and really, really easy to use. Um, any questions? I have a couple. Mm -hmm. um, Uh -huh. um, that might be that might be a limitation of the fact that it's VM when you tend to have less precise timing. Uh -huh. um, and that's actually one of the major reasons to try using a bare metal machine. Um, because you'll get better timing. So you should just before you put your that's a lot of time in registers to even um, check out whether the machine is capable of the time that you want. Um, all the all the decisions in our model are made by the controller, uh, and future uh, we want to move something into the sniffer. Let's see. So is the sniffer basically a honey pot? It's like a machine that you put out there. Yes, yes, out? yes. It's a actually another machine. Okay. It, but it, it's it's just a honey pot. It's not serving dual purpose, right? No. Okay. And I don't think it's a honey pot either, right? It's not a tracking probe. Maybe future when we um, move the, the logic to the sniffer, uh, the sniffer will create some some file periodically, and the, the um, controller will read that file periodically and to um, issue some actions to the to the switch. Is what we think. So it might be interesting to extend this work for DDoS detection. So instead of having a pre a set of clients that are already pre-configured. You could have some logic to say this is malicious. I, I, I know it's coming in the direction of using looking at post ID. Mm -hmm. D and DDoS, DDoS attack, uh, DDoS attack, yes. right? Yeah. Yes, because it's based on um, large flow. So yeah. right. Okay, so um, we'll move to the demo. This is the attacker, this is the client, um, and attacker is trying to um, connect the server, but um, in our uh, first, first logic, um, the, the traffic from the attacker to the server will be directly rerouted to the sniffer. So um, we can see the server and sniffer are running uh, both iperf on uh, iperf-s, and the, the uh, port is both 5001. And uh, they are also running TCP dump so that we can see if there's uh, flow um, tra uh, traffic into the, into the host. So let's see. They are, uh, I'm sorry. I'll um, I'll start my pox right now. Pox.py for both. 
Okay, it's connected. So um, the sniffer and the server are running both iperf and PCP dump. And when the attacker wants to connect to 10.10.1.3, which is actually the server's IP address, you, can, you will see that it will connect it to the sniffer. I will start a, a new iperf and you'll see that. Okay. So attacker will do iperf dash c ten dot ten dot one dot three. You will see the a sniffer is receiving a lot of traffic, but the server is not. Um, it is because the uh, attacker's IP address is not in the list. So uh, the when the package is sent to the controller, the controller sent back a flow entry. Said the the um, IP address. Uh, destination address, something has been um, transferred to the sniffer. So um, it is, you, s you can see it is um, actually connecting to the sniffer, the sniffer 100 uh, and here, and it will think it, it is connecting to the server. And let's see, do the same thing on client, iperf dash c. Because it's uh, duplicate, so um, both um, sniffer and server will receive something. Because we limited the bandwidth, so um, it's not really fast. And you can see bandwidth is 1.37 megabits per second. So that's our idea. Um, the IP address not in the list will be transferred, and the IP address in the, in the list will be duplicated. And this is our first first model, and we will see the next one. Wait a minute. Okay, so um, this logic is that um, the the controller will have the um, the statistic of the switch periodically. So. Um, when the attacker connects to the server, um, at, a, at, at the first seconds, we will see that both server and sniffer are receiving something because it's duplicate. But um, after seconds, you will see that the server is not receiving anything. Let's try. They are receiving, and after seconds, they stopped, but actually you can see the iperf is still running. Uh, it is because the um, switch has changed the routing table and it has uh, rerouted to the sniffer. But uh, now we can see the sniffer is not receiving anything either. Uh, we think the the reason is that um, some uh, flow, uh, some connection established in, uh, in 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 iperf. I'm not quite sure about that, and we will figure it um, later. So it's what the um, attacker does. See, they are now. I stop the iperf and run it. Run that again. You will see that um, they are they receives no more packets because um, the IP address of attacker is already in the blacklist. And let's see what client will do. Because the bandwidth is relatively low, the client will do the iperf correctly. And let's wait for 10 seconds. See, the bandwidth is 1.36 is equal to the previous one. So that's our whole project. Any questions? OK, thank you. My name is Vishal Anand. I'm from the State University of New York. Hello, everyone. I'm Grace from George Washington University. My advisor is Tim Sui Wu. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Lin Chang from Towson University. 
Hello, I'm Mufazil Makati from Rochester Institute of Technology. Hello, I'm Mahal Thai from the University of Massachusetts. Uh, all right. So um, I just want to motivate the problem, what we're doing and why it's important. Um, the title of our talk is Load Balancing and Fault Tolerant in Cloud Environments. And we're using software-defined networking to achieve some kind of load balancing and to achieve uh, fault tolerance. Uh, so I guess the two important aspects to our problem are clouds and software-defined networking. Uh, everybody's heard of cloud. It's everywhere. Your stuff is all in the clouds. And uh, clouds basically allow you to get computing resources, networking resources, uh, storage, all kinds of stuff in a distributed manner, not on your computer from anywhere in the world, anywhere on the internet, I guess. Um, and one of the key drivers for cloud computing is this concept of virtualization. You're only using virtual machines and all this kind of stuff, but all kinds of virtualization is going on. Virtual net, uh, network virtualization, uh, virtualization of computing resources. Uh, so what is basically network virtualization? It's a very simple concept. Uh, it's been around for a long while. It's basically a concept of virtual networking. The idea is uh, by using resources that are distributed uh, in different uh, infrastructure providers, so like say Sprint, at and uh, all these different infrastructure providers, you can pool these resources that are at different places, form virtual networks, and be able to use these resources on the fly. Uh, so that is network virtualization. and. Uh, Again, being able to use computing resources that may be in different parts. Pretty much what's happening in Genie, we're seeing that using virtual machines at different places. Uh, and of course, we all know what software-defined networking is. Uh, software-defined networking allows us to separate the control plane and uh, the data plane in network and be able to control uh, these virtual networks and networks uh, remotely and on the fly, modify routing tables. Uh, use protocols such as OpenFlow, uh, Floodlight uh, to modify routing. Um, so what are we doing? <clears throat> so of course, if you have a cloud environment, we have clients sitting somewhere in the world, uh, servers providing different kind of services somewhere in the world, and these clients are asking for different kind of, different kind of services from these different servers. Um, through the internet. So one of the biggest problems that could happen, a couple of problems that could happen is, of course, uh, for some reason, all these clients are going to the same server, and these servers get overloaded, and therefore get bogged down, not able to provide services. So you want to do some kind of uh, load balancing. You can do a couple of kind of load balancing based on networking traffic or the load on the clients itself, CPU load, uh, uh, what we focus on is balancing server load. The other big problem that could happen in such an environment is uh, failures, right? It's a very distributed system. There could be failures happening, failures in the, uh, in the physical infrastructure. What do you want to do? You want to be able to route around these failures. And we're using OpenFlow, uh, software-defined networking, using OpenFlow to be able to route around these uh, failures. So those are the two aspects we're looking at. Uh, Load balancing, balancing the load uh, on servers, compute load typically, and then be able to route around failures. Uh, I guess that's that's all me, right? Thanks. Hello. Uh, so in order to perform this experiment, uh, this is the high level topology that we'll be using to simulate this uh, load balancing scenario. Um, so let's say we have some couple of clients here. This is the switches. Uh, so this would be the infrastructure of any company or something like that behind a data center. Uh, here you could have the uh, internet, so there would be cloud. And if the servers are connected. Uh, so this, this part is basically the infrastructure of the data center itself. And we have a controller. So controller could be in the same environment as it is uh, as with the switches and servers, or it could be somewhere else also. Uh, uh, these are some of the tools that we used uh, in order to perform this experiment. Uh, 
definitely flag uh, netcat to see the packet flows and all http perf to generate http traffic uh, uh, apache is the web server that is running on the servers and then top we use top to monitor the cpu loads fox is the open flow controller we did uh, use open floodlight also in the beginning but then we switched to fox in the end and then curl curl we did uh, try to use curl uh, I'll, I'll show in the next slide but uh, that basically didn't work. So yeah, uh, this didn't work. Uh, what, what Fox has a web services that allows us to push, uh, push static flows to the controller from anywhere else. So we tried to do this uh, using curl. We can, send, uh, we can push the flows uh, from the servers itself. So basically, if the server is overloaded, it will send, uh, it will, it will send these uh, static flows to the controller and the controller push it that back to the switches and that way uh, we could change the flows based on the CPU load and all. But I found that the documentation was very bad. There was only one example that uh, for this example that I found uh, in the internet. And if I, I wanted to ch change this flows and all and this actions and matching and all parameters, but there was no proper documentation that showed us this. Okay, here is uh, the topologies we created using the Gini network. And we have two slides. One slide contains uh, the network topology and uh, another one contains the controller. We created a uh, very uh, realistic scenario that we have different clients request services from different servers. Okay, in, this, uh, in, this, our, in our experiment, we have four clients and four servers. Between these, there are two legal switches. The first layer is the uh, gateway switch and two uh, software switches between the switch one and the servers. And uh, for the services, we run the uh, HTTP port from the client side and uh, we install the Apache servers on the, servers, uh, on the server side as the web server. And uh, we generate the traffic, network traffic from client to request services from the server. And, uh, this is basically topology and uh, slice one and slice two, they are same uh, aggregate, uh, aggregate manager. And uh, later on, Chris will show the demo as how we do the load balance. And uh, okay, we just want to put the feedback a little bit earlier. Well, I believe it's uh, the first time for most of us to use uh, Genie to create uh, a project and. Uh, we feel that it's really, it's really, it's really a very convenient tool. The Genie provided us a very, uh, with a, a ready-made open flow controller and uh, open the virtual switch. And uh, it's, it's really like a, a real-world network with public IP. And uh, during, the, during the experiment, I believe all, most of us got a lot of problem issues. And uh, for here, I want to share some experience what's the problem we got and how we solve that. So the first one I think very important is the experiment design. Design your experiment, design your the topology based on your uh, scenarios. Don't get confused yourself by your own design architecture. And the second one is uh, give your aspect. This part is very important because when you uh, at the very beginning, we created the uh, we created uh, topology using flag. We can drag on the watch machine. Uh, it's very convenient, and based on our uh, scenario. But uh, maybe later on, we can got some problem. For example, you cannot log in the clients without any reasons. And uh, another reason, uh, another issue like uh, you want to identify which uh, which server, uh, which inter interface connect to the server or which interface connect to that switch, but when you bring down your IP, you cannot find that. It's very difficult to identify. So, and uh, if you accidentally bring down your control plane, that means you need to st start it over. So that's how it, it works. You, you save your aspect, and uh, you create everything just using your saved aspect. You don't need to modify anymore. And, uh, Another thing very important is make a node. This is like the example what we did. When we create the topology, we we'll make the node of all the information, detailed information of servers, switches, and uh, 
interface is from which interface is not that clear. So for once on one switch from this interface, we can connect to which server or which connect to which client. That's very uh, important for us also, especially for us we use uh, load balancer. We need a lot of uh, information about the course and the IP address and MAC addresses. Uh, the last one is script because, as I mentioned, we install the HTTP port for our, all the clients and we install the Apache on our servers. So if, if, we, if you just make a very simple policy, like only one client or one server, you can do it manually. But uh, when you create a, some uh, uh, complicated policy, some many servers, or even you start over, you can start a write a script to, uh, to install, all, uh, install all, everything and uh, make it more efficient. OK, now I think uh, Chris will take over and uh, show the demo. OK, so it's a demo time. First, let me describe how the load balancer works. We have four clients, and we have a gateway switch and two uh, edge switch and connect to the four servers. And here, there is our proc controller. We give the virtual IP address to the gateway switch, so uh, all the clients can only to connect to the data center with the virtual address, and then our, our controller will load balance this load, load, this traffic. For example, for the client one, it will go the, the traffic of client one will first go to the gateway switch, and then it will go to the server one. And for the client, client two, it also go to server one. And for client three and client four, it will go to server three. C server two and server four is just a big bank up. If there's something happens, our for server two and server uh, four will take up the work. So for example, if server one is overloaded, and the server one will report I'm overloaded to the controller, and then controller will push a new flow table into the switch. And then the traffic of client one will go to server two. Okay, let's see how it works. Okay, the red color is our controller, and here, here are our, uh, the clients, and the middle is the server. So first, let's start our controller. And start server one, server two, server three, and server four. Okay, so this is our client one, and this is our four servers. Uh, like I mentioned uh, previously, the traffic, normally the traffic of client one will go to server one. So let's see, client one connected. Hello. So here, the client one said hello, and the server one got a message. So normally this works like this. How about client four? So because client four, I, I Definitely, we use the source IP as the load balancer criteria. So for client four, it should go to server three. Hi. Okay, so here, client four said hi, and server three got a message. So this is normally how our load balancer works. So uh, now, let's say, what if the server one is overloaded? Okay. Actually, we can use some tools to monitor the CPU load, and if it's overloaded, it can automatically send a message to a controller. But for here demo, I just send a message manually. I use the channel to send a message.
Okay, here I set CPU high, then send this message to the controller. Oh no. Okay, I read something wrong. And there is specific format. Okay, so here I send a message CPU is overloaded to a controller. And now we can see controller uh, recognize that CPU is overloaded. Uh, okay, let's try this first. It's disconnected. Okay, so here I said hello again, and now it goes to server two. Server one didn't uh, receive anything. So basically this is our load balancer. And the next, the next thing is we not only want to do load balancer, we also want to uh, handle a failure. For example, this is our normal traffic. If our switch one is, is down, what should we do? We will transfer all, we will talk, uh, talk con controller our switch is down. You need to transfer the traffic to the other servers. Let's say a demo. Okay, so this one is our uh, switch, switch one, switch two. And I will make it down. You see here the controller notified there is a switch down. And so I just close the server one, close server two. And see here I just uh, use cloud one to send a message. Now uh, previously the message goes first to go, go to server one, and if server one is overloaded, it will go to server two. And now the switch two, uh, the, the switch one is down. It can't connect to server one or server two. And then I send a message from cloud one, it will go to uh, server three dynamically. So this is our four, uh, four tolerance. Okay, so with this, I will end our presentation. You, you, you guys did awesome. It was, it was very impressive. Um, I haven't been to all the summer camps, but the one other camps, but the ones I've been to, I think these by far were the best demos. So, congratulations. Uh, I'm sure. Um, and, and one of the things I think was great was you guys had you know, uh, felt free to ask questions and didn't spend a lot of trying, time trying to figure things out yourselves, and that helped. Even as you go out and continue to work with Genie, um, feel free to ask questions. Ask questions of us. Um, us look at the documentation, and then there's a user community that can that you should you should you should take advantage of. A few slides on where to get help. There's the Genie Wiki. The easiest way to get there is go to genie.net and click on the link to the wiki, and you will find um, tab, um, I guess links to for experimenters, for instructors, and so on. Most of you are probably interested in the experimenters link. And if you go in there, one of the things that's really useful is a collection of how-tos, how to um, you know, uh, write open flow controllers, how to create custom images, how to write install scripts, commonly asked questions that we thought might be useful for experimenters. So you want to please look there. Uh, please sign up for Genie users at googlegroups.com. This is a community mailing list, so if you send email to this list, it'll go to all the other members of this list, and uh, hopefully somebody somewhere else has run into the same issue you're running into and can help you. Um, to hear about what's happening with Genie, to get announcements about upcoming events, camps such as this, conferences, please sign up for Genie Announce. And then there's an experimenters group that is specifically for announcements that might be of interest to experimenters. So conferences where you might want to publish your papers um, uh, about, about training opportunities and so on. If you want quick help, there's a chat room, an IRC chat room. And then I also already mentioned the how-to pages. If you go to the experimenters 
section of the Genie Wiki. There's a button called Help, and that will tell you how to sign up for this mailing list, how to connect to the IRC chat room. Okay. Um, and then there's help at genie.net. Uh, if you send email to help at genie.net, it goes to people within the Genie Project office, including uh, the three of us who work here today. Um, it also goes to a few other people in, within the Genie Project office, but it stays within the Genie Project office in the sense that it doesn't go to the larger community. The archives of this list are however, however public, so if you have something uh, that you don't want to share widely, you may not want to send to this list. So if you, if, you, if you have a question that you're not sure if it should go to Genie users, um, you can se send it here, and we might uh, forward your question on to Genie users. Right. And uh, stay, uh, stay in touch. Let us know about uh, the work you do. You publish something based on your work on Genie. Let us know, including your master's and PhD theses. Join us at Genie events. Uh, I'll talk ab about a few Genie upcoming Genie events in the next slide. And there's also a Google Plus community page. Feel free to join it. Feel free to post. You know, if you published a paper, if you did something fun with Genie, um, uh, just post there. Um, post pictures of your topologies. Uh, uh, they're all welcome. And upcoming events. Uh, again, they'll all, they will also be announced on Genie Announce. So you uh, do sign up for that. The next event is the Genie Engineering Conference. This is held four, three times a year, uh, hosted by various universities. The next one is being, it will be hosted by Indiana University at Bloomington. Um, so there'll be plenty of tutorials. Day one tutorials are for newcomers. You don't need that. But subsequent days will be more advanced tutorials um, at the upcoming conference. Uh, There'll be tutorials on future internet architectures. Um, so uh, in the intro slide, Nikki mentioned the future internet architecture projects that are going on. They will be running tutorials at this GEC, the XIA team, the F Mo Mobility First team, the ChoiceNet team. They will be running tutorials. So that'll be really cool. You get to work with these advanced um, researchers, learn what they're doing, and actually use their protocols. There are also other sessions of interest to software developers, people developing tools for Genie, people operators, people operating Genie. Uh, Kai Chi mentioned uh, uh, the uh, CNERT workshop to be held in conjunction with uh, ICNP. This is the day after the GEC ends. And uh, it's too late to submit papers for this conference, but you might, we will have this again in 2015. And this is for experiments on any testbed, Genie or other testbeds. If you run experiments, it's to publish experiences uh, based on your experiments. If you will be TAing a class or teaching a class uh, that will use Genie, we do a, um, a train the TA uh, session uh, that will happen early in the fall. It will happen over WebEx or Google Hangout. It's, uh, it's usually two afternoons, two Friday afternoons, two three-hour sessions. Uh, the first uh, session, the first Friday session is getting started with Genie. Again, you can skip that since you have already gotten you know, started with Genie. But the second uh, session, the second Friday afternoon session is specifics about teaching a class on Genie. So how do you set up student accounts? How do you help students debug their slices, uh, the experiments? Um, how do um, uh, uh, resources available? There are plenty of, there are many um, ready to use exercises on the available. You can use those. There are instructor guides, student handouts. Uh, so, so we will talk about that in the Train the TA session. So uh, thank you. I hope the friendships and collaborations that were established this week continue. Take advantage of them. Um, all the best on your uh, uh, research. And um, safe travel back home. We have one more demo, though, right? Yeah, OK, good. It's up and running. Thank you. I'm Mohammed, Mohammed Salim uh, from Iowa State University. My supervisor is uh, Ahmad Kamel. Uh, my name is Jamie Ding. I'm a senior in computer science at Iowa State University. I'm Matt Wymore. I'm a PhD student in human energy science engineering policy with a co major in computer engineering at Iowa State. Uh, I'm Nikia. I'm also a PhD student um, in computer engineering. My advisor this evening is um, Mohammed is Jahan Kamal. Uh, my name is Zahid.
Okay, um, our title is Simulation and Performance Evaluation of Integrated Wi-Fi wi WiMAX Networks. Uh, our contents are problem statement and then system model after that problems and uh, challenges and then results and analysis, conclusion, future work, and finally, the demo. Uh, the problem statement that most uh, market products, uh, such as smartphones and laptops, uh, has uh, have um, integrated Wi-Fi uh, transceiver, uh, but uh, to have an integrated WiMAX, WiMAX transceiver, we must have a new laptop with that uh, transceiver. So if you want to receive from WiMAX, you have to get a new laptop or a new smartphone that has integrated transceiver of WiMAX. Okay. So the problem of, of that that WiMAX will not be popular. Uh, uh, as cellular mobiles and laptops must have integrated WiMAX transceiver. So to do that, you must have something like for your laptop USB for WiMAX transceiver somehow. So to avoid this problem, we can do a, a small solution which is using a wi WiMAX to Wi-Fi converter so that we can use the, the Wi-Fi, traditional Wi-Fi, but this Wi-Fi will have also a WiMAX interface. So in this case, the end user will have the Wi-Fi access, but the Wi-Fi will get its backhauling from WiMAX. Okay, is it clear? Okay, so here, the Wi-Fi access point we are using, it is not the traditional Wi-Fi, but it is a Wi-Fi with a WiMAX interface, okay? So finally, from the performance evaluation, we can answer this question. What is, what is the effect of integrating WiMAX to Wi-Fi converter to the WiMAX network? So after integrating this Wi-Fi, special Wi-Fi node, so what is the performance of the WiMAX network? So now we will talk about the system model. Our system model is just like, as you see, we have a WiMAX base station and two Wi-Fi access points and clients. These clients are Wi-Fi clients and these clients are WiMAX clients. So at the beginning, we wasn't able to access the Gini orbit, so um, we implemented our topology on flag, just the WiMAX phase station and the two access points and the client. So for Gini orbit, we, 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 we used it to carry our uh, simulation. So orbit is uh, a preparation for open access research test bit for uh, next generation wireless networks. So as we, you can see in this picture, we have 400 grid of Wi-Fi and the special Wi-Fi which has a WiMAX interface, okay? And it's all of them are covered with the WiMAX base station. Another picture, you can see uh, the grid, maybe here better. So here's the grid and here's the nodes we used in this grid for our simulation. And here's the base station and the uh, blue lines are WiMAX connections and the uh, black lines are the Wi-Fi connections and uh, the dotted lines are TTL cap. So before going to, con uh, before going to simulations, we, we uh, faced uh, many problems such as first thing, unfamiliar with Linux commands, but we Google it and try to find it and also we use the main pages. Uh, the second thing is determining our arch architecture. For determining it, we shared Google uh, uh, Docs and we tried to find the architecture to, to use. Uh, third thing, the forwarding from Wi-Fi to WiMAX. This was a, a great problem. So we tried to bridge uh, WiMAX and Wi-Fi, but we failed in it. But we did it with the netting. And finally, working with IBs and wireless connections, and it took uh, too much time from us. Results and analysis. As we saw this uh, uh, architecture, we have the WiMAX and the access points and the clients. So for our simulation, the first simulation we did, it just having the result from Wi-Fi to a client. And then we try to find between two Wi-Fi clients. After that, we tested the WiMAX clients, two WiMAX clients are talking to each other. 
and finally a WiMAX client and a Wi-Fi client. So for our results, the first thing we have the TCP throughput versus the wireless connection types. So we have four types of wireless connections that we just said in the, uh, um, the, the slide before, which is a Wi-Fi access point with a Wi-Fi client, the Wi-Fi client with a Wi-Fi client, WiMAX client with WiMAX client, and finally Wi-Fi wi client with WiMAX client. Here's the four types. And the three here are for maximum and average and minimum megabit per second. So as we see here, there is for the first one, which is a Wi-Fi access point with a Wi-Fi client, and it is the best uh, throughput. This is because the connection is um, connection between only the Wi-Fi and the uh, client. And then the other connection, which is between the two clients, so the two clients must talk within from uh, uh, talk to each other uh, uh, using the Wi-Fi. And then the other connection, which is a WiMAX client uh, talking with a WiMAX client. And here we find that it is very, very low. This is because um, our clients are using a USB uh, interface to interface with the WiMAX. And this USB interface with low power, so it's the data rate was very, very low. And the finally, we have the final connection, which is Wi-Fi and WiMAX. And it's somehow better because it's between the Wi-Fi and WiMAX. So the Wi-Fi connection is somehow better than the WiMAX. So both are better than this the third case. Also, we try to use U2B uh, traffic. So I think it's somehow similar to the last slide. So the first one is the best connection, and then the second one, and then the fourth one, and finally the third one. So the last figure is the uh, uh, RTT versus wireless connection types. And as we can see here, the RTT is very small and is a good uh, result. And then the second type, which is somehow it's uh, uh, higher than this one, but also it is acceptable. So when we go to the WiMAX to WiMAX and WiMAX to Wi-Fi, the RTT is very high. So this is a, the problem we face with this connection. So as we can see, every connection with the WiMAX, directly with the WiMAX, it, we have some problems in it. So for our conclusion, we find that Wi-Fi connections give a higher data rate and less delay than WiMAX connections even it is hybrid between WiMAX or Wi-Fi, or all using WiMAX connections. Uh, integrating Wi-Fi enhances the WiMAX network behavior. So uh, this may return WiMAX to the competition with LTE. So I think now we have Wi-Fi, uh, which uh, had output throughput of one gig per second, which is IEEE 102.11 AC. So I think using this Wi-Fi connection, with the WiMAX, uh, which is a new WiMAX IEEE 802.16M, I think this may be uh, find a good competition to LTE and LTE Advanced. So uh, finally, bridging Wi-Fi and WiMAX is non-trivial, but it is totally beneficial to the end user because all of us can now use this network, which has a WiMAX base station and Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi giving the clients which which are us, but if you want to use a WiMAX, so you have to get a USB modem for WiMAX or somehow. So I think this uh, type of topology is better for all users so that you can't change your laptop. You don't have to change your laptop or change your smartphone. You can use it with a Wi-Fi connection integrated in, in your laptop or smartphone. So uh, future work, we can repeat this experiment using WiMAX uh, FDD base station because the base station we was working on is a TDD base station. So uh, WiMAX FDD base station will enhance the performance of WiMAX network itself. So I think it will be good um, uh, comparison between the integrated Wi-Fi WiMAX and the WiMAX itself. It will give better results than the results we uh, get. Uh, second, uh, future work, we can conne uh, connection can be done from a client attached to Wi-Fi to uh, a another client attached to Wi-Fi client. So just as this connection. So for this connection, the client must talk to the Wi-Fi and then 
to the WiMAX base station and then to the Wi-Fi and then to the client. And this connection, we was working on it, but we don't have much time to finish the work, so we are recommended to work on it in future work. So finally, we want to acknowledge uh, everyone in the team. So uh, first, it was very difficult to get these pictures. So <laughs> 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 thanks to you, <laughs> you search on the internet. So we, we want to thank Sarah and uh, Nikki and uh, Vic and uh, Michelle and uh, uh, Ryan, which uh, I think he helped us a lot for in the wireless session. And finally, we have to thank, 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 <laughs> and with all language. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and now um, we will go to the demo, and after that, we will uh, accept comments and questions. So, if we remember from the uh, the WiMAX tutorial, um, in order to access the nodes in the test bed. You first SSH to this uh, console um, machine, which is which is behind a firewall, and then after you do that, then you're able to um, SSH to all the nodes individually um, with root access. So what we've got here, it's going to change the size on me. Um, the white terminal is that's our wireless access point that we're going to use. Um, the yellow one is the wireless, or the Wi-Fi client. So yeah, Wi-Fi access point, Wi-Fi client, and then this one here is just the, um, the WiMAX client. So uh, so uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the, the steps of setting up um, so that the client that is just on Wi-Fi talking to the Wi-Fi access point can then talk through the, the access point's WiMAX connection to a WiMAX client. So the first thing we're going to look at is on the WiMAX client. Um, there's this utility called WiMAX CU. I don't know, configuration utility, client utility, something. Um, and you can use that to, to check the status of your WiMAX connection. So you see the software radio is off, so we're going to turn that on. Radio on. And then uh, if we check the status again, we'll find that it is ready. Um, and let's go ahead and look at IF config real quick. So WMX0 is the WiMAX interface. Um, we don't have an IP or anything yet. So what we're going to do is uh, connect to the the WiMAX network. Um, so to do that, we do WiMAX CU. Can you see that? Okay. Um, connect network 51. And actually, you know, real quick first, I'm going to do a scan. So if we do a scan, we see that there's this network um, that the base station is advertising, and its uh, ID is. 51. So we do YMAX CU connect network 51 and it connects. And then if we do a status again, we'll find that we're connected. And finally, let's do an IF config. You see that we've also been assigned an IP. Um, so this one looks like it is connected to the uh, the WiMAX network. Um, one of the things that we learned <laughs> is that you know take it step by step. You make a connection, make sure that the connection works. <laughs> so let's check on the access point where we've already got the the WiMAX um, set up. Are we able to ping forty one 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 five one zero one our our WiMAX client? <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> uh, let's see. So let's see what's going on here. Do, do. Disconnecting, reconnecting, perhaps.
Okay, try this again. Okay, now it's working. So, I mean, that, that's an example of, a good example of a challenge that we had, you know. We think we're connected and everything looks like it's connected, but it's not. For some reason, disconnect and connect again, and it works. <laughs> so, um, so now we got a connection from uh, the, our access point to the YMAX network and from a YMAX client to the YMAX network. So now what we want to do is set up the access point as a Wi-Fi access point and then get a, a client connected to it. Um, so in order to do that on the, um, on the access point, we run a software, uh, software package called host APD. Um, and, and what that is basically doing is, is creating your, your I don't know, software access point. So, check. We're going to run that on. Um, oops, A. So the wireless, the Wi-Fi interface on our access point is WLAN two, and host APD um, uses a configuration file, host APD dot uh, conf. Uh, and so these are the configurations that we have here. We're using interface WLAN two. Um, you have to specify the driver. The SSID is, you know, what what the wireless network gets broadcasted as, and what you advertise as. Um, G mode, um, and the rest of that's not really important. So, um, so we can start that, uh, and, and you can see that that we've got um, one nine two one six eight one one assigned to our Wi-Fi interface. And uh, it says a net mask of two five five two five five two five five zero. So um, so we start the. Oops, actually, I'm gonna do host APD dash b to run in the background. Um, so that that is basically just kind of starting this access point software. So now our access point can can function as an access point. Running, yes, okay. So, um, and so that actually also brought up that, that Wi Fi um, interface, WLAN 2. So now on our Wi Fi client, um, it's pretty simple. Uh, WLAN 1 is our Wi Fi interface, and we've got it configured. Um, be in the same subnet as the um, access point. And so I'm going to use IW, which is a wireless uh, configuration utility. And we're just going to do WLAN 1 and check the, the status of the link. It's not connected. So um, if we do a scan, it um, checks to see all the Wi-Fi networks it can see. There are a bunch of them. Somewhere in there is that Wi-Fi one one that we just specified on the other. So we're going to connect Wi-Fi one. Now let's try link. Okay, so you can see that we're connected to Wi-Fi network with SSID Wi-Fi one. So now we should be able to ping um, ping the access point. Looks good. Should be able to ping back. To um, our client. Okay. So, but what we can't do yet is ping to that YMAX client. Uh, not working. How am I doing on time? Is it still good? Okay. Um, so, to do that, then, to be able to do that, there's, there's Two things. First, you'll see that if we look at the route table on our Wi-Fi client, um, there there's no route. I mean, it's, it's going to try to use the default for a 1041 IP. Um, so the first thing we need to do is add a route that's going to tell it um, if you get a 1041 IP, then you need to go through the access point. 
So that was one of the fun Linux commands that we had to figure out. Um, so route add and then net because we're adding a like a whole network that we want to be routing towards um, a subnet. So all 1041 addresses, um, that's basically what that means, to the gateway, which is our access point, 168.1.1, and that goes through device WN1. Um, so now if we look at our route table again, we've got an entry for 1041 addresses, send them to our gateway 192.168.1.1, which is our Wi-Fi access point. Um, <clears throat> so now, let's see if we can ping. No, we can't. Um, and that is because right now the uh, the access point is receiving these packets, but it doesn't have it doesn't know what to do with them. So we got to set up a rule that's basically just going to tell the access point um, when these packets come in, send them on further um, forward them. Uh, so the way that we were able to get this to work was using NAT, Network Address Translation. And so what that's basically saying is um, the access point is going to take this packet and make it look like it's coming from the access point instead <coughs> of from the Wi-Fi client. Uh, and then when traffic comes back, it's going to do that translation in the other direction. Um, the problem, I guess the, the problem there and then the challenge, the thing we didn't get to in, in like being able to send back into the, um, back to the Wi-Fi client is that, that when you do that translation, there's like, I don't know, it, trying to address the client from outside of the, the Wi-Fi network, it becomes a challenge. But anyway, um, so let's take a look at IP tables, which is um, the the Linux utility that that does the, that keeps track of these tables that uh, uses for forwarding and packet filtering rules and that kind of thing. Um, so the table type we want to look at is the NAT table. And if we just list it out here, um, there are currently no rules. Um, we have these four different tables, and that just is just saying like. At what point during the process are we trying to apply this rule to the packet? Are we doing it pre-routing, post-routing? Um, I'm no expert, so don't ask me any more questions about that. <laughs> um, but we're going um, so we're gonna add a rule then, so that uh, in the in the post-routing section. Um, for the output interface on X0, um, masquerade. Um, so that's, that's basically the, 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 the translation that's going on there. Masquerade, the client as itself was kind of. <laughs> anyway, um, so now if we go back and look, we've got this rule here. Um, and it's slowly running packets through here. Uh, but anyway, if we try to ping our other node again, ping the, um, the YMAX client, yeah, it's working. And you can look and you can see um, packets through coming through and, and, and getting accepted by this. That rule. Um, that's pretty much what I had for a demo. Anyone have any questions? Well, one thing I noticed the difference is uh, one of the differences is uh, I think they are trying to only use the uh, one direction flow, which is one client to server, so they can the, the controller specifically decide which path to deliver the traffic over from the client. And what we're trying to what we were trying to do is we kind of want to have a bidirectional traffic network, which means we have, uh, for example, we have two switch in between, 
and we have one node attached to one switch, another node attached to one switch, and they can communicate with each other. Node A can send traffic to node B, and node B can also tra transmit traffic to node A, and the switch in the between can do the decision based on the low latency algorithm. And so we are trying to propose the low latency algorithm and also for tolerant configuration. Uh, what do we mean by for tolerance is that, uh, for example, if one of the routes, uh, for example, the delay might be too high we decide the delay is not tolerant, then we move the traffic on that uh, path to another uh, one of the other uh, available path so that uh, the delay can be minimized or eliminated. So this is uh, basically the network topology we have. Uh, we have two switch here and two nodes attached to each one of them. And left and right links are pretty much the same with the, uh, in the tutorial. Uh, also, in our experiment, I, we used only one slice, and the other group used two slices, one for controller. And we put our controller on both switches. Oh, and, uh, the other difference is they use uh, Pax, which is based on Python, I think. And we use Trauma, which is, the, which is written in the language of both C and uh, Ruby. Uh, the reason we choose Trauma is that uh, we find out there are some instructions for developing low balance algorithm. So we, we, think, we thought uh, that might be a good starting point to for our project. So that's the reason we choose trauma. And we also think uh, the the algorithm available uh, online for developing low balancing in trauma language is not difficult to understand. So maybe we can modify those code a little bit and make the whole thing work in Time, timing manner. But uh, the worst thing is we encounter a lot of problems uh, which we were not able to solve. So we won't have a live demo for you guys today. Uh, we are sorry about that. But uh, I will try to present as much as uh, issue we had during that two days uh, to you. Uh, we, work, we, we were working on uh, building up the network topology on Wednesday. And it turns out at the end of the day, we still have problem to make the whole network uh, topology uh, work. And yesterday, we were trying to uh, working on the developing the whole switch scene and try to make the, our algorithm working. Uh, we worked with uh, a lot of uh, people from GPO. Uh, and we also were direct to work with uh, other member of the GPO remotely uh, till, uh, she was very nice, uh, she was very nice. Uh, we worked with, with her till 11 or 12 yesterday. Uh, but it turns out things doesn't work out for us. And, uh, but she has some recommendation maybe we can try in the future. So at this point, uh, maybe we just uh, trying to present that uh, trauma might be kind of uh, unstable uh, if you want to use. I th we think uh, Pax may be a better choice. Pax was actually another option for us. But as I mentioned before, uh, eventually we choose trauma. And uh, also, the 
Yeah, uh, regarding the virtual switch setting up, uh, we also have a lot of problems. Sometimes we try to, we think all the things should work for us, for the whole network, but it turns out uh, nothing works. There's no traffic uh, can be generated between node A and node B. And on the virtual switch, uh, we try to look up whether there's traffic uh, go through the switches, but we keep get the error message like uh, connection refused, and we couldn't figure out the the reason. So, yeah. So yeah, that's actually basically what we have today, and it's a shame we can bring you guys more food for Prince's attention, but. Uh, we try.